checking my... M hey, hello. <laughs> Where'd it go? There it is. <laughs> uh. Okay. We'll wait one more minute and then we're going to get started. Does that work for you and the online people? We're live now. Oh, we're live now. Hello out there in TV land. Always wanted to do that, say that. I remember that when I was growing up. <laughs> right? Still kind of cold out there tonight, huh? But supposed to improve here dramatically over the next few days. Wonderful. You can really tell a difference in the quality of the light these days, you know, as we now head into March and you can just like, yeah, it's coming. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and begin. I want to welcome all of you to uh, this Remember America lecture series. Uh, this is something that's been on my heart for some time. We did do a short series in the fall, uh, but I believe that we want to have more of these because there are so many things happening right now in our nation, and I think it's important for us as Christians to get our bearings, to look into God's Word, and to connect the dots, and you'll probably hear me use that phrase uh, frequently through these next four weeks, uh, from uh, biblical truth to historical evidences to where we find ourselves today and how we got here, and then how God can use us in His plan and purpose for advancing the gospel, even in a very dark time. Speaking about quality of light. Uh, but we're not without hope, and uh, we are so glad for that. So we'll talk about that tonight also. But let's just begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you as your children, and we appreciate that so much, that you call us your children. You've invited us to be part of your family through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would help us, those here in person, those that are watching online. Lord God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would enlighten our understanding, that we would be, come to a greater knowledge of who you are and what our role is in our generation to advance the gospel and how that might look. And it'll be uh, different for each one because you've created us uniquely in your image but with distinctives to fulfill your purposes. So thank you for the opportunity to learn together, and we invite you now right into our presence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so you can see and, uh, the, the whole point of this is restoring liberty. America as a self-governing nation. That was the distinctive of America from the beginning. And I believe that that was uh, purposeful, that God would raise up this nation as he talks about uh, in the Old and New Testament, that he's the one who raises nations up. He's the one that brings nations down. And so we want to understand, well, what is this idea of self-government? What's that got to do with liberty? What does Christianity have to do with the liberty that we enjoy here in America? So that will be the, uh, just four short weeks, but I think we can get a lot accomplished, but we're going to be really pressing ahead. Uh, so hang on, and uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. I will try to end each session with a little bit of time for you to uh, ask questions. Uh, but this first session is called Worldview Matters. And uh, you can look at that two different ways. We're going to be discussing worldview matters tonight, but we're also going to look at the fact that worldview matters. It makes all the difference 
in how we approach life and where we end up. And so we're going to specifically be looking tonight at a providential view of history. That's the backdrop for our discussion in these four weeks. So we spend quite a bit of time talking about that biblical perspective of history and why it is so critical and why we must teach authentic history to our children as they're growing up. Scripture is full of passages where God is instructing the Israelites, even in the New Testament, that it's incumbent upon us to pass truth to the next generation and the generation after that so that they recognize the hand of God in their own history. So let's, a couple quick housekeeping uh, tools here for us. First of all, uh, you have a note sheet, those of you that are here in person. I believe those of you who registered for the online session received a, an attachment uh, that you may want to print out or look at on your computer. It's just something that's nothing spectacular, believe me, but I, I just think it might help guide you and keep your attention there every once in a while. You have to fill something in just to, uh, in case I put you to sleep. Uh, the second one is the PowerPoint presentation that I'll be using tonight. That will be available to you. Those of you that have registered, uh, that will be emailed to you as an attachment or else made available online. I'm not sure how that will work, but you'll get notice about that. Those of you that are joining us and hadn't registered, uh, you can still register, but you'll specifically need to let me know if you want the note sheet or you want the PowerPoint, and we can send that to you. So just email me, but then go ahead and register. Then we have a record of you being part of this seminar. So enough for the housekeeping. Let's just get right into it now and start talking about Veltan Shoong. Repeat after me. Veltan Shoong. That is the German word for worldview, and it comes from the, the German for world and view, or perception. So this idea of worldview and was drawn for some, from some of the philosophers, some of the, those who studied thinking and, and those kinds of things in Germany, where a lot of uh, philosophers came from, it seems. But Immanuel Kant, back in 1790, was the one who actually coined this phrase. The idea of a worldview or an understanding of life was around for a couple hundred years before that, but he's the one that really brought it into focus gave it a name, and then it began to grow as part of culture over time. Uh, some of the great uh, psychologists and philosophers in the 1800s, William James for one of them, into the 1900s with somebody I know you're familiar with, Sigmund Freud, a favorite of all of ours, they really grabbed hold of this idea of worldview and tried to uh, illustrate its impact on society and how if we can control the worldview of a person, then we can predict outcomes that really fit for where we want to take culture. So it's kind of a scary thought when it gets into some hands. But <clears throat> by the time we got to the middle of the 20th century, the idea of worldview was really solidified. Now up into the 21st century, you see it everywhere. In fact, if you were to go to websites, especially Christian school websites, on almost every Christian school website, it says something about a Christian worldview or a biblical worldview. That's what we're all about. Okay, and so we're going to talk about that tonight, and we're going to try to understand, well, what do we mean by that, and why is that important, and are there differences in what we think will cause or develop a worldview in a student's. Here at Dayspring, that's one of our mission statement. We have four bullet points for our mission statement, and one is that we want our students to demonstrate a biblical worldview. We don't want them just to learn about it, and know the term, but we want them to be living it. And we believe that we can facilitate that with parents and the church 
and help advance the gospel in a very meaningful way. Let's begin by looking at someone that I think that we're all familiar with, and that is Francis Schaeffer. Francis Schaeffer uh, was a, a great theologian, a philosopher, a writer, uh, many, many books, uh, and I believe I misspelled his name. I think there should be a C after that S. My apologies on that. We'll have to correct that before we send out the PowerPoint. Uh, but he said, the Christian system, what is taught in the whole Bible, is a unity of thought. That's important. Christianity is not just bits and pieces. There's a beginning and an end, a whole system of truth. And this system is the only system that will stand up to all the questions that are presented to us in the face of the reality, as we face the reality of existence. We all live in this world, and we have a lot of things coming at us, a lot of questions, a lot of what we would call as inconsistencies or things that just don't make sense. sense. That's a lot of whys, what ifs. Schaefer says, having that whole total view and understanding of Christianity will answer all those questions. And I hope so, because Christianity is based on God's Word. G.K. Chesterton, who you may recognize that name, uh, said that some people, nevertheless, and I'm one of them, he said, who think that the most practical and important thing about a man is still his view of the universe, his philosophy. So he introduces this word philosophy, and so we want to see how those two connect. Now, some people get very nervous when you start talking about philosophy. They think, okay, I'm out of here. But philosophy is really a wonderful thing, and every one of us here, everyone watching, we have a philosophy of life. We have a philosophy of different aspects of our lives. Sometimes those different philosophies conflict with one another and it doesn't in this arena i believe this but when i'm in this arena i believe this and the two don't mesh dr david noggle who was from the dallas theological seminary and he is considered a worldview expert says i submit that the most practical and important thing about a human being is his or her view of the universe and theory of the cosmos that is the content and implications of one's world view so there's that word Philosophy and worldview, one undergirds the other. It's, which came first, philosophy or worldview? Well, I don't know. It depends on which way you look at it. So let's go to one of my favorite authors, one of my favorite people, and that is Noah Webster. You're going to learn a lot about Noah Webster in this series if you don't already know him, and I hope that you end up really appreciating him as much as I do, and I'm going to hold up this wonderful object here that is the American Dictionary of the English Language that Noah Webster wrote after more than two decades of study, and he defined the words from a biblical perspective and a governmental perspective perspective and that is important for us and the reason he did that is because yes it's the English language we're blessed to know the English language and use the English language but Webster knew that for any nation any culture any group of people to really have their own identity their language had to be unified. They had to speak the la same language. They understand the words that they use in the same way. And because America was new on the world scene and was trying a form of government that had never been tried in the history of the world, he knew that he had to define words so that it would help us gain an understanding of our rights and our responsibilities of citizens in a constitutional federal republic such as the United States of America. 
Anyway, we'll talk much more about him later, but I wanted to at least give you that little taste so you know why I keep bringing Webster up. Let's look at his definition for philosophy. It is a noun, and he says that literally philosophy is the love of wisdom. If you look at that word philosophy and you know a little bit of Greek, you will see that there are two words joined or two parts of words joined together. Philo for love. Sophie comes from the the meaning for wisdom. So it's the love of wisdom. It's a term denoting an explanation of the reasons of things. So be thinking, how does this fit in with worldview? Well, we're looking for the reason of things. If we can answer those questions, then we have developed our own worldview in an area. He says it's an investigation of the causes of all phenomena, both of mind and matter. It denotes the collection of general laws or principles under which all the subordinate phenomena or facts relating to that subject are comprehended. So this is just the first part of Webster's definition on philosophy. But there are some very important keys in that that help us connect to worldview and worldview formation and where philosophy ultimately goes. He continues and he said, that branch of philosophy which treats of God is called theology. And I might interject here that theology used to have a much larger role in education than it does today. In fact, it's part of uh, the, one of the seven subjects of classical education, and it was termed the queen of the sciences. It's where education began when students reached a certain age and were really uh, able to reason and dig deeper into things, theology the queen of the sciences. And he says the objects of philosophy are to ascertain facts or truth. He already said that, but now he's connecting this more to our understanding of God and the causes of things or their phenomenon to enlarge our views of God and his work. So he's identifying that God is the cause of all these things, all the the phenomenon that we see here in our physical universe. And he says that to render our knowledge of both practically useful and subservient to human happiness, the second great commandment. So, what was the world's first or the the first worldview on earth? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Was there a worldview back in the time of Adam and Eve? Did they have a view of the world? Did they have an understanding of the world and what it was all about? Yes, they did. Exactly. They had God's view at creation. Who was instructing Adam and then Adam and Eve together? God. So everything that they knew about life, about the world, about, you know, how everything worked here on earth came from God. So their understanding was this beautiful, perfect, complete worldview. There weren't any cracks in it. Now, they certainly didn't know everything about everything, but their worldview was such that God said it. And so it is so. So, what happened? Something is going on in this picture. Well, we know what happened. Sin entered. And when sin entered, everything changed. Keep in mind that Adam and Eve were formed in the image of God. Okay, they were special among all creation. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in some of the other peculiarities of the human race. But they had this relationship with God. It was a trusting relationship. They were without sin. They had this wonderful, perfect, unimpaired understanding of life. Sin came in, and there were consequences. Adam and Eve's God view of life was shattered. We could say it disintegrated. It fell apart. There were gaps. They they no longer could comprehend well, we would say now the things of the Spirit because they were 
natural man, natural, a natural man and a natural woman, rather than as they had first been created. So I want to just divert slightly, and believe me, we'll pull this back, but I want us to look at this fascinating word study that goes right with our understanding of what happened back in Eden. The first word is integrity. Very familiar word to all of us. We all want to be people of integrity. We look for integrity in our friends or, or in business people, so forth. Well, this word integrity comes from the Latin from integ integer, and I'm sure that you know what an integer is. It's a number. It's a whole number, and that relates to the definition. Here are three of Webster's definition for integrity. He says it's wholeness, entireness, unbroken state. And remember, we're trying to connect this to worldview at some point. He goes on to say the entire unimpaired state of anything, particularly of the mind, moral soundness or purity, incorruptness, uprightness, honesty, integrity comprehends the whole moral character. And then in his third definition, he says it's purity. It's genuine, unadulterated, unimpaired state. So do we have a good picture of what that word integrity means? So when we talk about being a person of integrity, it means that there aren't any cracks in our character, any dark areas that don't line up. David once prayed, he asked the Lord that for unity, that unite my heart that I might serve you. Okay? He wanted all those pieces to come back together so there wasn't this divided part of him. And the second word is integrate. Integrate means to renew, to restore, to perfect, to make a thing entire. Now, integrate doesn't came, come from the same root as integrity, but it is related to the word integrity. So we can see that right there where it says to perfect, to make a thing entire. That's what integrity was all about, being whole, being complete. So then we go to the third word, and to get to that third word, I'm going to introduce a prefix here, the prefix dis. Dis denotes separation or a parting from. So if we put that on the word integrate, we get disintegrate. If something disintegrates, we know what that means, right? It's breaking apart, creating the absence of things that were once there. So, can we see how this brings us back to what happened in the Garden of Eden when that worldview was shattered, when sin entered the human race and it all fell apart and there were big pieces missing in the understanding. And as time went on, man fell further and further away from that image that God had placed within his thinking. So here's another way of representing this. If we, we can see man's full dilemma in this diagram. Start off in the, ad, uh, up in the upper left-hand corner with integrity. We had this whole unimpaired view of life through God's lens. Sin came in, that disintegrated, and then the job, the task that was foretold in Genesis 3.15 is that the seed of the woman was going to bring about that change to, to redeem mankind back, to be able to regain God's view, God's uh, purposes for life. And that, of course, was through Jesus Christ. And when Jesus comes, everything changes, and we get back to that place. It's a lifelong process, I will tell you, as you already know, I'm sure. We're talking about the sanctification that the Holy Spirit brings, the renewing of our mind. That is a gift from God, that he's helping us, he's transforming us from glory to glory so that the more we study his word, the more time we spend with him, the more we allow his Holy Spirit to change us, the more we become like his son and that's a beautiful thing. And someday we're going to be with his son forever and ever and ever. End of story. Thank you for coming tonight. That was, that was good. <laughs> All right. Well, we will go on, though. 
An interesting aside, though, this idea of biblical integration. I told, talked about biblical worldview on, on schools' websites. Most schools talk about biblical integration in their curriculum. But what does that really mean, biblical integration? We kind of have an idea now of what the word integration means. So biblical integration, hmm. Well, I'll tell you, first of all, what it does not mean. It does not mean simply inserting Bible verses into a lesson or even just sprinkling a few Jesuses or gods in the discussion or praying before class or having a chapel. I'm not saying that those things are wrong and bad. I'm saying that they are just a beginning point. There's much more that can and should be done. Biblical integration means restoring the understanding of the school subjects, which in a way is like all of life for the child, but restoring those subjects back to the entirety of the view of the author of the universe, the one who actually created those subject areas. Let's find out what he meant. Let's discover what are the boundaries that he puts around those subjects. What are the principles or laws that govern our universe? And then when we begin to understand those things, we can apply them in a right fashion that will produce things that align with his purposes and will. That's a tall order, but why would we settle for anything less? God has given us a mind. He's given us his Holy Spirit. And so that we can peel back the onion layer by layer to understand more and more about God's character and his nature. And so often he is speaking to us through the creation itself. And then we have that precious gift of his word. It's a great combination. And once kids see that, grab hold of that, it opens a whole new world for them. And so that's what our goal here at Dayspring is, of course, and we work at that as faculty and staff to, to increase our understanding so that we can stand before them and we can teach the gospel through their subjects. All right, here's another diagram. This diagram has a lot going on. So we'll take a little bit of time and just uh, understand what it's trying to say. First of all, look up at the very top. It says, God's view of history. So that's the title of this diagram. I'm going to change that slightly and, and take that title off and put God up there. And then under it says, outside of time. In other words, God is on the whole slide. He is outside of that oval that contains time, but he's also inside that oval that contains time. But it's important for us to understand that God is not confined to time. He is not somehow uh, controlled by time. Human beings are. Okay? So what takes place inside that oval has everything to do with us in our earthly journey. On the left-hand side, we have eternity past. On the right-hand side, we have eternity future. God spans all that. Can we get to the beginning point of eternity past? Can we get to the end point of eternity future? No. In fact, as a child, I always loved science fiction, I'll, I'll, a full disclaimer here. I, I love Star Trek and stuff like that. But I used to, like at night, like I would lay down in bed and I would start to think, somehow I, I, I'm going to get hold of this, that God always was. And I would just think on that and I would look on one side and underneath it and try to like somehow get wrap my mind around it. And I never could, of course. But th that's because God is so much bigger than us that our human minds cannot comprehend his greatness. But this slide shows us that God is out there, but we want to focus on that timeline that is going horizontally through the middle. And it has three points on that timeline. We have creation. We have 
a cross and we have when time is no more. Now, we can kind of speculate when creation was, but we can't come up with an exact date for creation. People have tried, but I don't think we have the capability of knowing the exact date. We certainly don't know when time will be no more. Someday we will, but right now we don't. But that cross right there in the middle, we say that that represents Jesus Christ, the focal point of all history. And these timelines are very important tools for us at school because it helps us fit things in proper places so that we can understand what God's purpose and plan is during our time here on planet Earth. And Jesus Christ it's really all about him. It's not about us. See, that's where we get it mixed up. That's where secular education talks all about man's ideas, all the events, all the dates, all the civilizations, all the, the aspirations, what man can do, and failures here and there. But really, it's all about Christ, his story. And Scripture tells us that. Scripture doesn't tell us it's all about man. It's really all about Christ. And we'll see that here in a, just a few moments. First Peter 1.20 says, For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Back in eternity past, Jesus was. But has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. He became flesh. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, eternity past, who is, right now, and who is to come, eternity future. No end to him. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end in Revelations 22. Colossians 1, a beautiful passage of Scripture. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and, un and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have be been created through him and for him. Him, Christ, His story. Time for Webster again. Another wonderful, wonderful word that it's vitally important that we grab hold of. And that's the word providence, which is a noun, and then the adjective form, which is providential. Webster says in his third definition, the one that we really want to look at tonight, he says, in theology, there's that queen of the sciences, the care and superintendence which God exercises over his creatures. The care and superintendence which God exercises over his creatures. Now, Webster does a little lesson in here. He says, he that acknowledges a creation and denies a providence involves himself in a palpable contradiction. For the same power which caused a thing to exist is necessary to continue its existence. Now, what Webster is doing in that definition, I mean, he was brilliant and he was bold. He was confronting the deistic view that had come out of the Enlightenment that, oh, yes, there's a God in heaven, but he created the universe, and then he just sort of stepped back and is not involved at all. It's just kind of winding down on its own. And so he, sh he shows the illogic and that thinking. He does go on though, and he says that some persons admit a general providence, but deny a particular providence, not considering that a general providence consists of particulars. A belief in divine providence is a source of great consolation to good men. By divine providence is often understood as God himself. And you will see that, and I will illustrate that uh, this evening, that often in our founding letters, documents, and so forth from that colonial founding period, they will reference God as providence with a capital P. That, that was a name they had for God. Nowadays, we're not that creative. We don't have a whole lot of names for God. Okay, we say God, we say Jesus, the Lord, but they had wonderful ways of expressing his character and his nature. 
I do want to give you an idea of one of the, the tools that we get from these definitions, and that is to identify key words. So we're looking at definition for providence, but as Vicka knows, we don't just stop at the definition and say, okay, I read the definitions, I get it. We look at key words in the definition, and we underline key words, words that we think, I need to look more into that because that's going to help me understand this definition. And one of the key words in the definition for providence is superintendence, the care and superintendence that God has for all his creatures. And so superintendence means care and oversight for the purpose of direction and with authority to direct. So there we see a couple things, but we're thinking governmentally now. We're seeing, okay, God has the authority to direct things the way that he wants them to go because he is sovereign. He is creator God. We are his workmanship. He created the world. He will do with it as he sees fit. And it's good for us as his creatures to recognize that and then to be thankful for his providential care and oversight of our lives. That doesn't mean that he will provide every little wish and want that we have because his goal is for our good. And sometimes that involves some things that aren't pleasant because that's the best way for us to learn it. That's his providence too. So sometimes a bad thing that we think is bad, it's God's goodness that has allowed that to come into our lives, to shape us, to hone us, to bring that wholeness, that integrity that we're talking about. So that's the beauty of using Webster's Dictionary when we're doing word studies. Throughout the Bible, nature, history, and the varying fortunes of individuals are attributed to God's providential control. At the same time, individual personalities and second causes are fully recognized as having their proper place in his plan. So here we see one of those, what we may call a divine paradox. God is totally in control. He's sovereign. And yet, we're not like puppets on a string and, you know, we just do whatever God tells us to do or why bother? God, whatever God wants, God's going to get anyway. He ha here's where that he has allowed us to participate. That's mind-blowing. In fact, I think he expects us to partner with him in his work on earth. And so that's a beautiful thing, but we have to understand that it, it's one of those things that it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. And you can see in Christianity, especially over history, you can see different people, different denominations and, and ideas that land in certain extremes of what we just shared there, and yet you can find evidence for both in Scripture. So God's got something beyond what we can naturally understand, but he helps us begin to see it clearly and know how to walk together in love, and that's a beautiful part of his providence. One of my favorite verses, uh, this goes back probably to one of my first years in principal approach, education and understanding. And this is out of the J.B. Phillips translation. And I just think he, uh, he does a beautiful job of, of expressing this, these two verses. He, he said, for God had allowed us to know the secret of his plan. Isn't that amazing? Almighty God allows us human beings the ones who disobeyed at the beginning, to know the secret of his plan. And this is his secret. This is the plan that he purposes in his sovereign will that all human history will be consummated in Christ, that everything that exists in heaven or earth will find its perfection and fulfillment in him. We saw that in Genesis 15. God already knew all about Jesus, who already existed. In fact, we can cross that line into eternity past, before the foundation of the world. But he allows us to know the secret of his plan. And that is inspiring to me, that, that God, he's not trying to withhold 
But his love for us compels us to seek his face, to serve him with a whole heart. That's what we want to instill in our children as they're growing. So let's take a look at uh, this providential view of history. It takes the account, into account the fact that God has everything under control. We can trust him in that. And it takes the written word, revelation, by the word, and couples it with Holy Spirit-inspired human reason. So we couple the inspired word of God, and then we join that with the Holy Spirit-inspired, renewed mind that he's giving us. And when those two come together, then we gain understanding about God and his purposes and his plan, and it gives us hope. We don't go down in despair because we know that our loving God has a future for us. The cause of his story is God himself. He's the one that initiated it all. Every aspect of it, including what Jesus sacrificed for us out of love. Now I'm going to come back to Noah Webster, this time not to the dictionary, but uh, Webster wrote a lot of things too. One thing that he wrote were letters to a young gentleman commencing his education. That young gentleman happened to be his nephew, and he was getting ready to go off to college, and so Webster wanted to instruct him. And so he, and it's a quite a wonderful passage, uh, several pages, and we look at that in ninth grade in our Rudiments of American Christian History course. But he uh, specifically wrote, but reason without cultivation, without experience, and without the aids of revelation is a miserable guide. It often errs from ignorance and more often from the impulse of passion. And so part of our role as parents and as teachers, as mentors, is to help disciple our children as they grow through youth to adulthood in this understanding that they can't do it on their own. They can't, uh, that it takes time and God's word instructs us. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my pathway. Uh, how does a young lad keep his way pure? By keeping it in the word of God. The word of God instructs us and the Holy Spirit enlivens our mind to be able to understand and apply it to us. Paul taught the Corinthians that the natural man is not capable of understanding the things of God. But after Christ comes and makes us new creatures, that opens a whole new world for us. And so this idea of reason with revelation was very important in our founding period. Charles Rollin, who was born in the uh, 1600s, wrote a wonderful work called Ancient History. And you can see his worldview, his understanding of providential history in what he wrote. He said the study of profane history would little deserve to have a serious attention and a considerable length of time bestowed upon it if it were confined to the bare knowledge of ancient transactions and an uninteresting inquiry into the eras which, in which each of them happened. But we know better because we understand a providential view of history. And now I want to divert from the slide and I want to read something to you. Uh, this is out of one of the curriculum guides that we have for principal approach here at the school. And this was written in the 1800s. So this is evidence of a biblical worldview that existed even back in 1848. I mean, we were really nearing the, uh, the, the precipice that we were going down. And it is interesting uh, what uh, Heb uh, addresses in this introduction to his book. He said it's called The Study of History. He says, The study of history is the most fitting nourishment to promote the growth and strength of the expanding intellect of the youth. Time is precious, and better will be our regret should the days of our youth have been spent without enriching our minds with something of the knowledge of God and of the human race, which is hoarded in the lap of history. But having acquired this treasure, we shall feel amply rewarded for our labor 
as we discern the hand of our Heavenly Father and recognize with grateful hearts the wisdom and goodness of the plan He has prescribed for the advancement of mankind towards civilization and perfection. Thus, the study of history, while enriching us with an inestimable knowledge of past generations, is also leading us to a better acquaintance with God. Clearly are we taught that he extends his protecting hand over all his children and that all are called into being to fulfill some wise purpose. You who think that chance has brought forth all that exists and that chance decides the fate of nations and of individuals, read history with becoming attention and you will soon acknowledge your error and joyfully testify to the great truth that an intelligent, all-wise, and benevolent being is the creator and ruler of the world. Isn't that beautiful? And that was written on the eve of the publishing of Darwin's Origin of the Species. So all of the evolution stuff was in place and growing and getting ready to burst forth, and it's interesting that he identifies that in this little opening, that if you think chance did all this, you're missing it. So, uh, yeah, I just love that uh, very much, as you can tell, I'm sure. <laughs> Evidence of the providential view in America's founding. William Bradford, another one of my heroes, pilgrim governor, wrote in 1656, but these things did not dismay them, the, all the disasters that they were facing, for their desires were set on the ways of God and to enjoy his ordinances, but they rested on his providence, that care and superintendence, and knew whom they had believed. That's the essence of the pilgrims. They set their eyes on God and they trusted him through thick and thin. That doesn't mean they were superhumans and never uttered a word of complaint or never had any problems, but they were a people of the book and they did their best to live by it. And what a great example that we have in them. George Washington in 1755 wrote, by, but by all powerful dispensations of providence I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectations, for I had four bullets through my coat and two horses shot out under me, yet escaped unhurt, although death was leveling my companions on every side of me. And he attributes that to the providence of God and protecting him. Of course, now we can look back on history and we can rejoice and thank God that he protected George Washington, who became such a dynamic leader and uh, you know what um, the founder father of our country and what a great example he is for us to hold up for our children to learn things from the Declaration of Independence itself talks about protection of divine providence reliance on the providence of God for this endeavor of separating from England then uh, Reverend Fulgham in 1876, uh, which was not uncommon at all for pastors to preach election, election sermons, artillery sermons, memorial sermons on certain uh, commemoration days. And he had such a keen understanding of providential history. And he said, history is not a string of striking episodes with no other connection but that of time. It is rather the working out of a mighty system by means of regularly defined principles as old as creation and as infallible as divine wisdom. The interests of a citizen, as well as the sentiments of a preacher, have led me to speak of the providence of God in our history, a history as wonderful as it is unique. With the psalmist, we can say, he hath not dealt so with any people. He went on then to say, whatever is noble in the character of our people or heroic in the annals of our history is deeply grounded in their constant recognition of a divine providence. 
in human affairs and the immutability of moral law. The one, the object of their daily trust, the other, the inspiration and rule of their daily life. He was painting a, pric a picture of what life was like, what society generally was like during that time. Those first hundred years were hallmarked by this biblical understanding of life. Did people sin? Well, you know better than I that yes, of course they did. But... There was still this understanding of life and they believed in God being sovereign and that God's word was true. And we've fallen far from that. Neglecting to teach America's history from a providential view, which sadly has been the case for, and I crossed out nearly because it's now more than 100 years in our nation, leads the citizenry in a non-Christian or a secular interpretation of history. And it leaves us without hope for the future. If this is all there is, then our lives are full of fear, mistrust, not knowing motives, trying to protect ourselves. That's not God's view. That's not the Christian way. This neglectful approach is a superficial approach. It is today's social studies approach. The result is to make us an irreligious or an unspiritual people. Most students are unable to see that all history is related to the unfolding of his story of liberty, both internal and external, religious and civil, or spiritual and temporal. See, this idea of liberty, which is the theme for these four weeks, when we talk about restoring liberty, make no mistake that we're talking about the liberty that only comes through Jesus Christ. See, that was the underpinning of our nation, that the liberties that we enjoyed, we understood that they came from the Christian principles of liberty through Jesus Christ. And if we abandon those principles, those pillars, those bedrock foundations that America was built on, we will lose our liberty because that liberty is inexorably tied to Christ. That's why we need to really, really be praying for a great awakening because we truly are on the precipice some, at some point, we could cross the point of no return. We can read in Jeremiah 17 that God declared that if he raises a nation up and that nation obeys his command, follows his ways, he will bless that nation. But if that nation that he raises up does not follow his precepts and his principles, then he will think differently of the future of that nation and he will supplant it. So there's a lesson in that for us because he, he's not just talking about Israel there. He expands it to any nation. So let him who has ears hear. Let him who has eyes see. That's where I believe we are in our nation right now. But I believe that God's mercy is great and that we cry out to him for mercy that he would allow us to rise to the fulfillment of the gospel purpose that I believe was at our founding. So when we look at the providential view in education, the secular approach separates Christianity from America's history and our thinking. You will not hear the, this line at all in government schools today. It's been totally eradicated. Remember the sons of Ephraim? This is in Psalm 78, which is a wonder, I call it the education psalm. It talks about the importance of passing truth on to the rising generations, even the children yet to be born. It says, they forgot the hand of God in their history, and dire consequence had followed. They did not have any weapons to defend themselves. They lost who they were. They no longer recognized who they were. They had forgotten the God of their history. 
Verna Hall, who was one of the founders of the Foundation for American Christian Education, which is the principal approach organiz uh, umbrella organization, said forgetting or forsaking the hand of God in history, forgetting or forsaking the word of God as a, the, America's political textbook, our economic textbook, and our social, cultural, and educational textbook, this alone has produced the results that we have in our nation today. She wrote that back in 1965, by the way. We talk about the Bible being the central textbook of our curriculum. Sometimes I get really odd looks from people when I say that, and they think, wow, what is this, like a glorified Sunday school? You're, you're teaching math and science and computers and, you know, astronomy, or, uh, yeah, astronomy from the Bible? Right. But that, is, that was the source of all knowledge and understanding. Yes, not all the details, not all the definitions are going to be there, but the principles that undergird all those layers that we continue to uh, put on there as we understand more and more still have their roots, their underpinning in biblical truth. If we separate that, then we have disenfranchised our children and our children's children from a godly future. Rosalie Slater, who was uh, right alongside of Verna Hall back in, in founding uh, the principal approach that we know of today, uh, said that the failure to recognize the importance of the providential approach has resulted in educating Christians to live in two worlds, a spiritual world and a secular world. This was not the way of the pilgrim who lived in one world. The world created by God, ruled and directed by God for God's purpose and God's glory. There was no sacred, secular dichotomy. And I would say to you today, it used to be that when there was that dichotomy in our culture here in America, and, and there was a separation, eh, they were pretty equally respected and so forth. But have you noticed how the spiritual aspect of life is being canceled? in America today, if I can use that term. That's the goal. That's a sinister plot, and we have to remember that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but there are principalities and powers, rulers in high places that are determined to tear this nation down and other nations. I'm not just saying that it's just America, but America, which we will look at next week when we look at America's Christian history timeline itself, from the beginning the aspiration, the desire of many, many of our founders, those who laid their lives down, who ventured into uh, the vast unknown, they saw, they desired to see this nation become a city on a hill, a light for the nations, to bring Christian truth to the nations. Here's a chart that we're going to spend some time on when we get into the last week. But I want to give you a glimpse of it so you can ponder it a little bit. Uh, remember about thinking governmentally from cause to effect? Can you see what this chart, this table is teaching us, is telling us? So we'll have time and we're going to fill some of those uh, segments in with examples that will help illustrate a very important Thing. And we're going to look at a quote that is attributed to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, nobody really knows if he actually said it, but I don't care. It, it's good and it's true. <laughs> so whether he said it or not, we can learn from it. All right, you know, the four W's. Who in providential history, prov the providential view. God is the who. It's all about God. What? The events, the individuals and nations he uses to fulfill his purposes. Where? Geography, the stage that he has set for man's activities. There's a whole study that we could do and we can't do on the providential view of geography, that God has fashioned the earth to be exactly where it's supposed to be. It's not evolution. It's not just happenstance that these, this continent bumped against that one and that one and this one. But God had a plan for the arrangement for his purposes, and it's for the advancement of the gospel. We get into that in school. We look at that and how uh, the advancement of the gospel went from continent to continent. Why? The gospel. 
the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. He is the message of liberty. The liberty we talk about. When we look at the timeline, we're looking at the flow of liberty through time. And we see Jesus Christ as the focal point of that. He brings that reintegration, liberty, internally first. And then the external will follow. I hope to be able to get into some of that. We might have to tack a couple more weeks on. Just kidding. Okay, we're about out of time. There are some wonderful scriptures here. Uh, Acts 17, when Paul is talking to the Athenians. Uh, what a wonderful section there. But he's really answering critical race theory. Now, critical race theory has been a long time, around a long time. It really began to solidify in the United States back in the 1930s. But it is really you know, rampant right now. And a lot of people don't understand what in the world is it talking about? What are the underpinnings of this? And I will tell you that it's an unbiblical understanding of God's principle of individuality and Christian self-government. But here Paul is talking about it and he gives right off the bat, there aren't separate races. We very freely, casually talk about different races. That's unbiblical. There's one race. Scripture is very clear that all peoples came from one man and woman. And God has allotted their times, their, where they are on the earth, their settlements, and, and so forth. So again, it comes back to the providential care of God over his creation. God has set the time for nations to exist, their borders and their boundaries. And for us here in America, we have to know and understand that God has set the boundaries of the United States. And so for our students to recognize, okay, this wasn't us. We didn't just happen to do this and we captured this and we did that and so forth. But we have to understand that God is in control and that he is fashioning us for his purposes. I keep coming back to that, but if we lose sight of that, we become very arrogant. And Deuteronomy 8 talks a lot about once you get into the land, he's talking to Israel, he says, once you get into the land, be careful that you don't say it's because of our strength, because of our might, because of our wisdom that we have all this now. And I would say, take caution, America. God has blessed you greatly, but lest you think it's because of our genius, the character of our people that we have become the, the superpower, you know, on the planet. Pride cometh before a great fall. Okay, in, in case you thought that I'm just a flag-waving American and I want America to be number one, I love America. My heart breaks for America. But what I want to see from America is that America fulfills its role in advancing the gospel to the ends of the earth. And I believe that a strong Christian-based uh, culture will accelerate that rather than hinder it. And let's see, we're getting to the end here. Okay. Here's just a series of comparing and contrasting to show you things. I, I think you'll, you can look at these PowerPoints on your own because I don't want to go too far over, but I'll give you an idea of how this works. On the left-hand side, we see a Christian worldview, how Christians address this aspect of society. On the right-hand side, we have some form of a pagan or secular worldview, an unchristian, unbiblical worldview, the natural human way of looking at things. And I put different names up there depending on the topics, but you, you will see that we have evolution, we have socialism, you know, we have uh, communism, you know, all kinds of different forms of this secular view. On the Christian side, the Christian view is that all things happen by design, by God. The evolutionary view that all things happen by chance over billions and billions of years. Christian, one can only understand history by identifying God's hand in history. What, what was God doing? On the evolutionary side, one can only understand history through studying man's purposes, what he decides 
to do. Christianity says that man is created as a rational, moral being with free choice. Evolution says that man evolved from nature and has progressed through adaptation to nature. He's subject to nature. And so you can see I go through many different things here. Man's heart is primarily, primarily determines his external condition. Out of the heart comes all the issues of life. Socialism says, no, it's actually the environment. And if we could just get the environment the same for everybody, then it would be utopia. Everybody would be satisfied. So we see strong contrast between God's view and human's view. So I have a lot of those on there, but I want to take you now to this uh, final quote. This is from Reverend Fulgem again in that wonderful sermon in 1786, or 1876. The more thoroughly a nation deals with its history, the more decidedly will it recognize and own an overruling providence therein, and the more religious a nation it will become. While the more superficially it deals with its history, seeing only secondary causes and human agencies, the more irreligious will it be. So that's the terminology he used back then, but I think you get the point. Okay, that's thinking governmentally, cause to effect. Every effect has a cause. Every cause has a previous cause. We didn't get where we are today in a vacuum. It didn't like all of a sudden, you know, it's the 21st century and everything disintegrated around us. What is evil is now good and what is good is now evil. No, those things have been happening generation by generation for some time now, the eroding of the Christian foundation of our nation. The doctrine of divine providence is a distinctly biblical doctrine and it matters. So thank you very much for your attention. Do any of you have any questions or comments or challenges to what I've said tonight? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much for being here. Next week we are going to look at the 10 links on America's Christian history timeline and why that's important, why we teach that here at the school and what is in between some of those 10 links because history wasn't just 10 things that happened, but we want to really look into uh, the fabric of how our nation arose among the nations of the world. And then we're going to look at the Constitution, the little booklet, I forgot to bring mine in, but we are going to use that uh, it's not something that we're going to use as a textbook that we're going to uh, go through the whole thing. But why it's important uh, is because I think it, it very clearly gives us a philosophical understanding of the Constitution. And it also gives us some very clear practical things about the Constitution. So we're going to look at both aspects, the letter of the Constitution, but also the spirit of the Constitution in that third week. And then the fourth week, we're going to bring it all together and look at what I believe is one of the most important keys to the future of our nation, and that is education. Because remember, cause to effect, cause to effect. Thank you. Good night.